Good morning my fellow treasure hunters. It's been a while since I've done a video. To be honest with you, I'm not the greatest video creator. I'm really an Indiana Jones. Uh, I'm a researcher and I'm a explorer in the field. And those are the things that I enjoy doing. Uh, for a long time I've been trying to get this channel going though to help support some of our efforts to draw in a group of people that are interested in what we do and to find new contacts and information because the lifeblood of any activity or any um, advent, any type of uh, group is new ideas, new technology, new research and even though we have enough research to continue <laughs> for a, several lifetimes on different projects, many times we find that people are working on the same projects or same information from a different angle, a different view, and when all these information and ideas cross, then we start to get a better picture of what's going on with our history and with this research. I've titled, you know, our this channel is called Treasure Exploration Research and Recovery and that's one of the things that we do but in all reality my heart is in the research of history and the record of our past and to me real treasure is all this information information is actually a greater treasure than anything physical that we can have anybody that's a Christian or anybody that believes in an afterlife the only thing we can take with us out of this world is the information we have gained the friendships that we have made and the wisdom or learning that we have take that we can take with us in our mind and in our hearts and so physical physical goods gold silver actual treasure is is actually just a fleeting thing and for me it's not really the treasure itself that's alluring even though you know Physical wealth is attractive for the things that we can do, the things that we can accomplish, and the good that we can do if we have the ability to do it. Um, it's difficult to accomplish anything if your finances are not in order, if you are not able to go on adventures and to go on trips, if you can't engage in your hobby, if you can't engage in the things that you like to do, then your life is is you don't have a very good quality of life and one of the things that my family looks forward to is all of our trips in the field to go hiking to go look at a new petroglyph panel to go look at a new trail or a new canyon or a new um, some of them are metal detecting trips some of them are looking for old Spanish history but to me all this is treasure hunting it is uh, the research of the history of our past and understanding our past helps us better understand who we are and, and where we need to be. So much of society today is trying to erase the record, the history of our past. And whether good, whether bad, whether uh, evil or corrupt or whatever our past history has been in this country and in this world, we cannot disavow it, we cannot ignore it, we must learn from it and do better. Uh, you, you've probably all heard the famous quote that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. And so we cannot ignore our past history. We can strive to do better, but if we erase it, we are going to repeat it. We are going to repeat all the bad and all the terrible things that have happened in history are going to be repeated because human nature being what it is we are in a big cycle a big circle the Navajos have a saying that says all things go round in the circling winds and that indeed is true there is endless patterns of history that continue to go around and if we do not learn from our past from our history and from these things then we are going to repeat those same mistakes and those same problems that we had. And that's what I see in our country today. That's what I see in this world today. This big push towards socialism, communism, Marxism is a terrible repeat of past 
lessons that those that are trying to perpetuate this are trying to destroy our history so we will forget where we came from and to prevent us from seeing where we're heading if we do not change our course. Anyway, um, this morning I'm just sitting here. I've got one of my new mugs here. Uh, on, on one side it says, I'm not lost, I'm treasure hunting. And then on the other side it has our treasure exploration, research, and recovery, the new logo. I really like these cups, these mugs. I've had, had several of them for a while now. I've also got one of my new t-shirts. This actually has the old logo, the treasure exploration and research logo on it. They're a little bit different from, from this logo, but I actually like this logo. It's really rustic and it seems to blend into the shirt, into the hoodie. On the back, I've got uh, this logo that has Bigfoot. It's a uh, Bigfoot with a metal detector. And he's got his ear, earphones on, his metal detecting earphones on. And um, that's just one of the fun designs that we've got. And I'm going to put in the links down below where you can get these different t-shirts. I've got a lot of treasure hunting t-shirts, a lot of hunting t-shirts, a lot of outdoor t-shirts. There are some family t-shirts. Uh, I'm starting to do a series with people's family names. I did my own family name, the Crawford family name, which is a Scottish, proud Scottish ancestry. The uh, Crawford line goes all the way back to um, William the Conqueror, and uh, one of the Crawfords back there, Sir Reginald Crawford, was knighted by William the Conqueror. And also William Wallace, who whose mother is one of the descendants of the Sheriff of Ire, who is also one of our descendants. So William Wallace's mother was Margaret Crawford. And of course, uh, Malcolm Wallace was William Wallace's father. And so we have a lot of notable history on our Crawford lines. They go back to the Druids, um, back to the uh, Knights Templars, the Scottish Knights, the Scottish Masons. There's a lot of... Uh, a lot of proud history there with the Crawford line. Anyway, I did a, a t-shirt on the Crawfords that's available on Teespring that has Scotland, has our Crawford family, um, the kilt, the crest, the colors, and the crest is on the front. And then it has the, uh, the Scottish um, tartan is what I was trying to come up the Scottish tartan colors on the back with the outline of Scotland. It's a real pretty shirt. And I'm going to start be doing some of the other names of, of families and things that I've come across. Anyway, if you have an interest in having your having a t-shirt done for a family reunion uh, with your crest and your little your country of origin and some of those things on the shirt, I'd be happy to design that for you. And, and put it up on Teespring or one of these other sites and you guys can go on there and, and buy those shirts. I don't make a lot of money doing it, but I really enjoy doing it. And um, it helps support this channel and we're always trying to do good things with, with our trips and include a lot of different people. And we're trying to help preserve our history and some of the, and to find the things that are missing from history and some of the things of the past. And that's one of the things I'm going to talk about today. I recently visited with my good friend and fellow uh, colleague and adventurer Dan Lowe. Dan's been with me on many adventures. We actually became friends from a historical site and uh, he was the moderator on a treasure hunting site. Um, and as a moderator, I got on there and posted a, I was searching for an individual, a family, for one of my research projects. And I corresponded with Dan, and he put me in touch with the lady that I was looking for, the, the ancestor of this particular individual. 
and Dan and I have been close friends ever since. We have a lot in common and we really enjoy research, we enjoy history, we enjoy the thrill of the chase, and we found quite a few different things over the years, and we're hoping to find some really great things in the future. Anyway, you can support Dan by purchasing his books um, at Tuscoro.com. Dan Lowe is a very prolific and, and excellent writer. He's written books on Jesse James. He's written books on the ancient history of America, kind of the, uh, the treasures of America. And in fact, let me get a couple of the books that he's written and you can look at these. This is one of his more recent books. Um, I guess his re most recent book was, was Jesse James, the book on Jesse James. But this one is The Treasures of Utah and the Mysteries of the West. And um, this is a really good book that talks about some of the, the histories of the past, uh, the histories of Utah, and has a lot of good details in there for those of you that are researchers or treasure hunters. Anyway, recently Dan's family came down, uh, they went down to the Lake Powell area, they're visiting with a friend of theirs, and I was able to go, I took my family, we went over and hung out with his family for a day over in Kanab, Utah, and it was good to see them. Anyway, we went to a couple of petroglyph panels, and... I took Dan to a really interesting petroglyph panel, one that he had not been to before, one of the few that he hadn't been to before. And this was a panel that I found in one of my exploration, one of my trips into the field. And I was following out some old rock markers and followed the rock markers and it took me right up to this petroglyph panel. And while, while Dan and his family and my, me and my family were out there, Dan's son found a little petroglyph panel, a little one that just had a couple of signs and symbols on there uh, that I hadn't seen before. And so we discovered a new little panel, and I'll show you some pictures of that. But today I want to talk about these different petroglyph panels and how if we can learn to interpret what these petroglyph panels say, we would understand much about the history of the past. Too many people in modern archaeology, anthropology, you know, the study of the Native Americans, the ethnologies, they do not admit or believe that these petroglyphs are actually a written language. And that's where I would disagree, because I believe that the only thing that many of these people had that would last was the record of the record that they wrote on rock, the um, the stones that have been pecked into and painted on, are the only things from the past that have very much permanence. Everything else is decayed. Even these petroglyph panels, these pictographs and petroglyph panels, have been degraded by the forces of nature, of wind and, and rain and water and freezing and thawing, the sand blasting against the surfaces, and so they're starting to fade. And so one of the things that Dan and I have tried to do is to document and record these petroglyphs through photography, and through videography and to preserve these panels in photos and images for future generations. Many times with the modern cameras and the technology that we have we can enhance these petroglyph panels and see details that we cannot see with our naked eye. And this is important because some of the fine details of these panels have been erased by the nature's forces. Anyway, I'm a firm believer that these petroglyph panels have many 
many different meanings. And if we can start to understand what these meanings are, then we can start to understand the lives of these people and also find many of the things that they've left as by way of where they lived, where they traveled, where their water sources were, what they used for food, as well as I believe many of these things lead to some of the old mines and some of the things that they may have left, historical treasures, things that they may have buried, where their village locations are. And I think that anthropologists and archaeologists by not putting more effort into understanding these panels, they've left a lot on the table. They have, they have ignored many things that they could have discovered and passed on to future generations that are being erased by time because they have not focused on it. Now I have to admit that I think some of the reason they have not focused on these things is because I believe it would reveal, and I think that there are those that understand this, I think that it would reveal things that they do not want to be revealed. I believe that there has been a concerted effort by history to have a certain narrative. And this narrative is wrong. And, you know, you, you, can, you can look at, I like what America unearthed, some of the things that... Um, they've done on America and Earth, and I'm, his, the name of the individual that does that on the History Channel slipped me for a second. Uh, uh, Scott Walter. I believe that, I like Scott Walter, I believe he's honestly trying to uncover some of these historical mysteries and to unravel the history that has been hidden by, whether it's the science, the Smithsonian, the powers that be, that want to keep God or the rise and fall of civilizations and the worldwide travel of civilizations long before science wants to admit that it actually happened. There were people coming to America hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before archaeologists and anthropologists want to admit. Society has gone like this not like this. Science want you to believe we crawled out of the mud as an amoeba, turned into a land mammal, evolved into a monkey, evolved into different primates, and then evolved into hominoids, and then evolved into man, and then we've been evolving ever since. We're going to higher and higher heights. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. God created man in his own image. He created all the animals, and he put them in a, a world with forces and controls that keep everything in order. It's, a, it's, a, it's created by divine, by a divine hand and it has divine order. Without this order the whole thing would collapse. The times and the seasons, the weather and the water that comes to the earth that feeds the land that allows crops to grow. If one element, one atom, one particle of any of this was out of balance the whole thing would come apart at the seams. We would be like without form and void. Anybody that studied science and DNA and history and anatomy and all these things like I have, anybody that has studied these things knows and understands there is a supreme divine creator and order to everything from the DNA all the way up to the whole big picture of the universe. And we cannot deny it. Anybody that denies it's a fool. You cannot deny the order of the universe. And none of these things could have happened without a supreme divine creator. And I'll argue that point with anybody. And yet, science want us to believe that the history of this country has been like this. In reality, the history of this country has been the rise and the fall of civilizations. When people were good and honorable and worked together, they built and achieved, and when they turned the battle into war and human sacrifice, they collapsed. And then things started over again. And then other peoples and countries, people from other countries and places in the earth, came here by, sh by ship, by sea, through the Bering Land Bridge when, the, when things were frozen over. It wasn't just one group of people coming here. There's evidence that, that 
the Aborigines from Australia landed down in the very far southern points of South America. That the Indo-Greeks came over here into the central part of the United States and had Greek colonies. We have maps from, the, from Spain and Italy that go back far, far earlier than when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Where did these maps come from and how do they have various points of accuracy without somebody actually physically being here? We have evidence of the Vikings being over on the Nova Scotia and on the northern parts of the coast of United States and, and southern Canada. We have all kinds of evidences of their existence and people coming here from various times. We have millions and millions and millions of metric tons of ore taken from the copper mines the, the, uh, to fund the Bronze Age. Where did all these millions and millions of tons of ore go? Not just on the American continent, but went all over Europe. That's what funded the Bronze Age. And scientists could take samples from those mines and test all the bronze that they have in Europe, and they would know with absolute certainty where they came from and an approximate day to which it's come from. They will not do that because the evidence will overwhelmingly show that there were people coming here, trading, mining, and, and, and taking those ores to fund the Bronze Age in Europe. Um, let me get back to the petroglyph panel. The petroglyph panels are record, recorded histories of the people that were here throughout various times and periods. They're not from one civilization, they're from many civilizations. We have many different styles. All the way down in the Amazon, there's panels. All the way in South America, the, the Incas and the Aztec wrote on the stones of their temples with different styles and things that match many of the petroglyphs that are in here in Utah and Arizona. Which makes sense because all the Aztec and peoples, all these native tribes that live in these areas today, the Utes, the Paiutes, the Gosh Utes, different tribes all the way down through southern Arizona. The Totono Totono o Odom have Aztecan, their Uto Aztecan language. They're a Uto Aztecan language base. In other words, their basis is Aztec. And so we know and believe that the Aztec people came from somewhere in Utah, whether up by the Great Salt Lake, the Bear River Wildlife Refuge, the Place of Whiteness, the Place of the Crane, or over in the Uinas area where we believe that the inland lake, the giant inland lake, used to be. We can see the outlines of it. Perhaps this is where the Aztec made their home. We know they came from this area and they left because of great, probably earthquakes, volcanoes, just as the Washu people, the Washu tribe talks about when the great earthquake struck and there was fire and fire in the sky and there was darkness and all the water that was in the giant lake drained out in just a couple of days. And when this lake water dried out, they said there was many big fish all over the ground. And the Washu could no longer get in their boat and paddle over to visit their, their friends, the Paiute. And the Paiute could no longer get in their boats and float over to see the Washu. They had to now walk on dry land. And so, from these oral histories, these histories, we learn about many things that you'll never hear about in science. But the record of these events, and many more, are recorded on the petroglyphs, on the stones that they wrote on, that these people wrote on. I believe that on these petroglyph panels that the things that are closer to the ground, when you're looking at a panel, the things that are closer to the ground are relative to where you are at, where you are standing. And the things that are up on the panel are further away. And in fact, many of these panels, I believe that, that it's referring to where you're standing is referring to where you're standing looking at the panel. 
And the vista that you can see off into the distance, if you look on the panel, many times you can see different features, whether it's mountain points, trails, canyons, or rock incorporation, where they've taken a crack in the stone and made their trails go around it, where there may be a wash or a canyon. Um, you'll see spirals that mean go up or spirals that mean go down. You'll see places where villages are shown. And in many instances, you can look out over the surrounding horizon and you can see these points that are represented in these panels. Now, some of the things in these panels are spiritual. You'll see gods, trapezoid shape, or, or different colored figures, different colored paintings. When you get into the pictographs, the different colored paintings are relative to different things, whether death, or spiritualism, or, or the here and the now, or families, or enemies. All these things you can see represented in there and start to understand some of these different figures and features. Now I'm going to show some pictures from some of these um, this panels that we looked at and talk about a few of these things as I look at some of these pictures and try to explain how we can start to understand what some of these things mean. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pull up these pictures and go through them, and then as I go through them, I will put the picture on the video. All right, well, I've tried to do this petroglyph video for quite a while now, and I'm finally getting around to it. Talking about interpretation of the petroglyphs, I, I just want to give a quick quote I don't know if you can see that or not. On a Facebook um, page that I'm a member of, I made this comment to a guy when talking about interpreting petroglyphs. I said, identify the surrounding area and its features. Are there ruins nearby? Water, trails, canyons, or cliff rims? Does the panel exhibit any rock incorporation? using features on the glyphs, rocks, to represent the actual location in the geology. What about caves, lava tubes, or very prominent points or rock formations? What about possible solstices, solstice alignments, hunting areas, or water collection features such as natural tanks or water holes? Take a close look at the location on Google Earth. Do any of the shapes or features line up? Most glyphs are location-specific maps, or information about lineage or the author. Then you have prayer glyphs, event glyphs, ceremonial, informational, and cache. And I, once again, I'd emphasize that most petroglyphs, most petroglyph panels, at least at some part of the panel, it is a map, or incorporates the general area into the petroglyph panel. Right now I'm going to give a couple of examples of that. Right here we have a petroglyph panel right here in a cliff edge. This particular panel is in southern Utah. I'm not going to give away the location because there's too much destruction already to a lot of these petroglyph panels. We do take some groups to some of these panels, people that have been vetted and we know that they're not going to destroy panels and stuff, but I'm going to show you this particular panel is a map. Here's the particular petroglyphs we have right here. And there's there's a, a squiggly line right here that goes along. There's a line that comes up here with a line that stops. And then there's a series of figures morphs, features, glyphs, little signs and symbols. And after carefully looking at this panel, this little section of this larger panel, I realized that that upper section of this, there's a big panel here, this is the upper section, was talking about basically the land features above the panel. And I'm going to show you in detail how this works. Okay, if we look right here, we have 
One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. At that point, we have a trail. And on this map, there is a trail coming down. I'm going to slide this over a little bit. Get back onto my, my picture here. So we go one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. At that same junction, shows a trail coming down. There's a trail coming down off that edge of that cliff. Now, how do I know this? Because not only can you see it on Google Earth, but I went and hiked it. So that's a way that they could get up on top of this formation. So you go from there to another point. So from that point, one, two, three, four, five, and almost six. So from, from this point, one, two, three, four, and it doesn't really show up as detailed. I mean, it's more like one, two, three, four, and then part. One, two, three, four. It's not as accurate as this other section. But indeed, we do have a drainage on top right there. And as you can see, this drainage comes from the edge of the cliff. It goes up here, and then there is a... When I walked up this trail, and it's a hand over fist, it's a steep trail, there is a man-made feature right there. There's a man-made feature right here. Right where these few trees are, there's stacked rocks. Right here, that at one time obviously dammed up and put a little pool of water right here for drinking or growing crops or whatever they did. And you can kind of see how some of the water may pool right here too, but the, the dam that they built was actually right here. So they're showing this dam and these cliff edges on the map. They show the trail coming down. Every time I move this, I'm going to lose that. But let's get back to it. Shows the trail coming down, zigzags back and forth. And sure enough, this trail zigzags back and forth. And it ends up right here at this feature right here. And on the ground, in this feature, there's a bowl. Right there. That's probably a camp spot. That's probably where they had a pit house or they, or they had a summer area, a place where they chipped um, pet, uh, arrowheads and spear points. Maybe they ground all these trees in here are junipers and pinion trees. And they gathered both juniper berries and pinion nuts off of these trees in season. And they ground them. They'd have a, a, a rock, a big rock, a matate, and then they would have a smaller rock, a mono, and they would grind those seeds and make bread or flour or whatever you, whatever you want out of it to make, uh, you know, probably wasn't really bread. It was more like a, a hearth cake or a, a type of a little cake that they baked in the coals. It had pine nuts and pinion berries and seeds and all kinds of stuff in it. Well, if we zoom out a little bit here, I'm going to have to move here a little bit. We're going to get to these more, these little animal morphs and human figures. From this circle, if you come down an approximate distance, you will see on the ground that there's this jagged line of stones comes all the way across here. Many of these stones are human placed other than these great these great big ones. There's there's a, a line of stones there. And these line of stones on the ground actually make up the headdress on this petroglyph of this human figure. Also, when you're on the ground, you can see, and you can, on Google Earth, if I didn't have all these lines overlaid here, you could see the approximate outline of this figurine in the shape of the landscape. Once again, this one comes over and down from the edge. This one comes over and down. 
You can see the outstretched arms. I'm going to lose it again. And all these lines and these things are representative in these little clearings and these little rock piles and things that are actually still on the ground. Now I don't know if they actually stomped those figurines into the ground or made lines with sticks and rocks if they, or if they actually just took the land features themselves. They looked like these figurines and so they ended up representing that on a map. So this ends up being a really big map of the features in the landscape below. You see these little morphs, these little lines, all these things that are in this petroglyph exist right here on the ground. And I carefully went over the ground and looked at it. And it is amazing to me how they were able to do these things in a map above on the cliffs without having an aerial view down on this area. It's just amazing to me. Now if we look a little further, we see these radiating water lines. These, those are where the rain water or the wind hits that, those higher edges and then rain runs down those and they make little highlights. Well, let's look over here on this map. We can actually see these three. This, there's actually four. One, two, three, four. Well, one, two, if we counted this ridge, there would be four. These are the drainages in the bottoms. One, two, three, four. One, two, a ridge and a drainage. So there's actually four features, just like in the map, that run all the way up the cliff run through all these things and come down here below to where all these little more you know these human figurines and symbols are at we can see these little little things here a little scorpion looking thing um, in the right spot. I'm not in the right spot. It, that's... I haven't... Some of these I may not have put on there. Yeah, we're right there. We're right up here. Some of these I have not overlaid yet or tried to find, but this is that little triangular shape area with a kind of a cross through it right there. And you can see that they've rock incorporated. They've got this edge of the rocks is actually kind of a little wash that comes along right here makes a wash right there. There's kind of a little canyon wall. It's hard to see on Google Earth, but when you're actually right there on the ground, there's a pretty good wash in there, right down, the, right through here. And you can see these little lines right here and here, that little line in the dirt. They actually are there on the ground. Now these, I haven't added these yet, but if we come over here, Okay, so we're, we're right here from this thing. If we come over right into this area, we can actually kind of see this little figure right here. You know, now that I don't have any of the drawings over the top, you can kind of see this little figure, this shape, right here. Do, 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 and the two little ears, right here and right here. There's a tree growing up there now. And then you can see the two legs right here coming down. So, you know, the, the features are there. They're still there on the ground. You've got a line coming down right there. So, it's, it's, let's see here, it's right, it's right below this leg. So, I don't know if something's got in the way or if, it would be probably approximately right there. There's kind of a line right there. Then you've got this little guy. Looks like a guy falling. His head and he's got an arm up here and that and his legs are all kind of twisted there and right there. Well you can see that little guy right here. His legs. You can see his 
arms. You can see his head right here, and you can see his arm right there. That little shape right there is, is these features right here. Now, you've got to realize that hundreds, literally hundreds of years, 800 years of time, this particular petroglyph spot is, is approximately 800 years old. And I know that because we surveyed that area with, I surveyed, helped survey that area with a team of archaeologists back in 1994. So in 1994 we surveyed this area and they took some samples of some dendrochronology and some different things in, in a little spot that they dug and got some wood material and it was dated to 800 years old in 1994. Now if we go further on our map down below this, this line, then we start seeing these other little features that I've got outlined here. Zoom in on these. So you can see these, these other lines. I need to orient my map a little bit. But you've got these, these circles are really defined on the ground. Those are, I think those are old pit houses. Those features right there, and those lines coming down, and this trail coming down here, and whatever these little lines are here, all these things, that's the end of my photograph, but all these things actually exist on the ground. And there's some more really defined things that are off on my next photo. So this, I know absolutely that this particular panel, this particular section of the panel is a map on the ground starting with the cliff rim and all the things that are incorporated into it. It's even more um, apparent from this, let's get rid of that, we'll move this one over. I'm going to go to, let's come over here to this area. Okay, then I need to kind of zoom out a little bit. Okay. All right. This next one is even, even, is very telling. Okay, right here on this petroglyph panel we've got a a ledge, a rock incorporation. There's that, there's that edge. There's that edge right there. Right here. The trail comes over the edge and loops around this valley. The trail comes over the edge and loops around this valley. Comes all the way around the bottom of this, this rock, this valley comes all the way out and around this strange shape. This is jogs around. And yes, there is a trail down there. I've been down there. And it gives you this shape. Well, if we zoom in on this, we see this head shape here on the ground. This is in washes. This one comes down, comes down. And then we see the shape of the humanoid figure with the two legs. I call this TV man because back in my day these look kind of like TV antennas. So you got these TV antennas and um, here's his legs coming down there. The wash is actually right here and right here but I I was trying to draw it on Google Earth and it was kind of hard. But basically you have the trail and this formation on the ground down here Below him, this figure, you have this really, really green area right here. Which makes total sense that you have this green area down below. Here's the figure. Here's the figure. Down below you've got this, this double line which means water. In many cases this means water. These double lines single line is trail or path, the double lines are water. Well here we have the sign or symbol for corn. These are little little signs or symbol for corn. Many many areas 
on petroglyph panels you'll find near the water where they planted corn. Well, this area right here, this green area is right here, there is where the springs are at. And this little channel right here, historically, is where they used to grow corn, which is right below this figure. Um, we can go on and on. This panel has many, many features. I want to point out one little interesting thing up here. Yes, there are more trails that actually go off and there's more of these little figurines that are expressed in the landscape. But I want to point out this is an interesting little little creature that we have right here. I don't know that's in focus very good but the picture is a little bit out of focus. This looks like a bird, a strange bird with one, two, three, four wings and a funny looking tail. Funny round looking little tail. Little round tail, four wings, you've got his head, his beak, and he has a crest on his head. A nice shaped crest right there. I'm going to show you that bird. I can find it. There's the picture of that bird right there. I don't know if you can see that, but this bird, I don't know if you could draw a better representation than that. This bird is a prehistoric four-winged bird with a round tail, a crest on his head, and a little stubby, little stubby beak, a crest on his head, and four wings with a round tail. Do you think these things existed at the same time as the people that pecked them on the ground to represent a bird like this flying? I think it had to have been something that they actually saw and not something that they found dead. They wouldn't know what it was from a skeleton and they certainly couldn't draw it unless they'd actually seen one up close and personal. Very interesting. Many of these petroglyph panels you'll find little animals, zoomorphs, or um, humanoid or animal type glyphs that look like known dinosaur species or known animals that are extinct and scientists and archaeologists the, um, the ones that have been corrupted by the powers that be that don't do their own thinking will say that those are just imaginary imaginary creatures, imaginary animals. Don't believe it. No, don't believe it for a minute. Many of these animals existed on the ground in the existed at the time that these Indians existed. Whether these are Paleo Indians or whether they're more recent Indian tribes, whatever tribe or group of people was responsible for these petroglyphs this animal was alive at the same time. Okay. So that's an example of a petroglyph panel that is actually a map of the area. Why do you think that it would be important for these people to have a petroglyph panel? Why would it be important for these people to have a petroglyph panel that represented the area. Why is it important today that we have GPS and Google Earth and um, all these maps and features that help us to find our way just across the country to visit ancestors or friends or relatives or go to a, to a, a vacation onto a place we've never been before. We punch the information into a GPS or into our car or into our phone and it takes us right to these areas. We don't have to do very much very much exploring or we don't have to be a map specialist or do any of these things to be able to arrive at our destination. But back in the day of these ancient people in many instances 
these people had to find their way back to the land where they were their ancestors are from or their parents or their relatives and if you were to come back to a, a location where would you go to find where the medicine man or the person that wrote this glyph or the family that lives in this area and whose information is contained on this map board all you would need to know is the location of this map board you could go there if you understood the symbols and the signs were written on there you would understand everything about the area where the people lived where they grew their crops where their water was at and where you could find them and so I think that that's what these many of these map boards represent is a record of the area in which these people lived and the importance of particular sites and features in these areas maybe they left for the season and they went away and maybe while they were gone something happened and the old the old man in charge died and his son had to take charge and come back and bring the people back and all the information that they would need that's in this old man's head about this area is right there on the ground right there on that map and they could go to the area they would know where to raise their crops where to do things and that information would be passed on from generation to generation now we know there are many sites that are not just maps they can be a prayer location they could be a ceremonial location they could tell about where something is hidden like their pottery or other types of records or or valuables to them a cache of moccasins a cache of food a cache of pottery so that when they come back to an area they can retrieve those things and use them uh, they couldn't always carry everything with them when they went somewhere else for the winter or migrated for the summer or whatever went to a hunting grounds and then came back they had to hide their items and protect them so that when they got back they would be there for them and so they could go back to their normal lives they don't have beasts of burden per se they didn't have horses or mules to strap everything on to go to their hunting grounds for the fall they had to cache their things and hope that the neighboring group or people didn't come and pilfer their things while they were gone and so many of these petroglyph panels are just information panels for the people in the area the groups or the tribes to per, to give those people information about where things were at and I think that's why we have so many different types and a lot of confusion is because each of these groups of people had their own means and method of communication I don't think they wanted other tribes and other groups to know or understand per particularly understand the signs and symbols that they put on the rocks I think those are specifically for their own group their own people their own family and so I think that's why you see a lot of similarities overall but you see a lot of regional differences in the petroglyph and pictograph panels.